Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. I like that opening where we both just kind of appeared there on the screen. Very dramatic. Very dramatic. Nice. We got the third leg of the Triple Crown coming up with the Belmont Stakes and that big, big day of racing there and a lot of Memorial Day action. Yeah, Matt, let's not forget about Memorial Day. We're not going to focus on Memorial Day this week uh, as we're still waiting to see the Hollywood Gold Cup, uh, of course, drawn on uh, Monday, Memorial Day Monday at Santa Anita. But we know Lone Star Park. Hey, let's let's uh, celebrate Lone Star Park just a little bit, Matt. Uh, Lone Star Park has six stakes on Monday, 1.2 million. They have an all stakes pick four that includes the four biggest races. It's a pretty big day for our friends there uh, near Dallas, Texas. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, uh, the, that pick four all stakes has got a $200,000 guarantee, starts in race nine and ends in race 12 with the 400,000 Steve Sexton Mile, which is grade three. Brian, have you been to Lone Star Park? I've never been to Lone Star Park, Matt, but I'd like to go at some point. Shaw's heads a pretty wide open field, I think, in that Steve Sexton Mile, undefeated Shaw's. And then the, don't forget about the Texas Derby, which is another wide open race. I think there's a lot of horses that could win that Texas Derby. Maybe AP Secret is the horse I'm leaning towards a little bit, but a nice day at Lone Star Park. Matt, it was a good day at Pimlico last Saturday. I'm gonna I'm gonna put this up right away because I think we need to look at a few things here that are revealed in this Preakness chart. First off, we were wrong. We were wrong, and we were wrong because we both were on the Philly secret oath. She went off at the second choice, Matt, five to one. Uh, I, I I complained about her trip in the Arkansas Derby. I I can easily do it again here in the Preakness, but. You know what the difference is in the Arkansas Derby? I thought she was the best horse in the Preakness, not so. Yeah, Brian, you know, the bottom line is uh, uh, whatever you want to think about who your top pick was in the Kentucky Derby and now in the Preakness, we're talking about the, the Triple Crown races, and that means that they are going to be pretty tough fields. And I think it was – a, a competitive, strong field, at least four or five very good horses in the Preakness, and a lot tougher competition for Secret Oath against the boys than she had to face in the Arkansas Derby. Yeah, well, she was shot off pretty good by Happy Jack early, checked hard. Happy Jack, who I wondered in why was he in the race after – running not so well in the Kentucky Derby. He got overbet in the Kentucky Derby. He got overbet in the Preakness. And then he bothered both Secret Oath, two of the main participants, Secret Oath and Epicenter, in, in the first uh, furlong out of the gate. Uh, so Happy Jack, uh, I guess he was in there to bother the, uh, the two favorites, as it turns out. Epicenter also was bothered early. He got uh, off to a bit of a slow start, Matt, and then was uh, uh, checked back, squeezed back even farther. Who would have ever thought that Epicenter would have been farther off this much slower pace in the Preakness than he was in the Kentucky Derby, which had that crazy fast pace? Yeah, Brian, that was certainly surprising, although there was something in me that I expected something a little bit different was going to go on with Epicenter, and for whatever reason, and there's been a good good bit of debate on uh, social media and and uh, in podcasts and and things like that about uh epicenter getting out of the gate blaming the jockey but others just saying hey he just didn't seem to come out of the gate with as much interest uh and and, and forwardly placed energy as he did in some of his other races however you know i i, I can't blame the jockey because he came running at the end of the race, so it wasn't as if uh, Epicenter was in there and had no interest at all in, in in putting out a big effort because he eventually did. Yeah, I still don't like the trip of Epicenter either, Matt. Um, you know, they, 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 they did not run a fast quarter, and and uh, early voting was certainly one of the horses to beat going in, and, and, and I felt like uh, 
you know, for reasons of not the, the horse not getting out of the gate fast, the horse not accelerating quickly, uh, soon out of the gate and then getting squeezed back a little bit. He was just too far off this pace. And uh, I think it was disappointing. Disappointing if you were on the uh, uh, six to five favorite. I know the connections, of course, including trainer Steve Asmussen were quite disappointed with where he was early. Early voting might have been the best horse anyway, Matt. We said he could win if he keeps improving. Looks like he is still improving. I thought he sat a dream trip behind a speed horse that we just didn't think would be a threat down late. Yeah, that is for sure. He did have a perfect trip, but, you know, uh, uh, Chad Brown, uh, everything went his way with the, his decision to skip the Kentucky Derby with early voting after that second place finish in the Wood Memorial and, and get him ready, give him a little bit of time. Don't let him run in that 20 horse field uh, at Churchill Downs uh, to prepare for the Preakness. And, uh, you know, hey, the result certainly continues to point out that Chad Brown is one of the best trainers at picking out a target and picking out a race and having a horse at his very best for that race, because that certainly happened uh, in Baltimore. Yeah. For that reason, I love Chad Brown. I think Chad Brown is the top trainer in America. I wish his horses ran just a little bit more often, but Hey, it's working for him. Chad Brown, you can't uh, argue with the results. We do now have a Kentucky Derby winner that wasn't in the Preakness, and of course a Preakness winner that will not be in the Belmont. We also should men mention Creative Minister. Not all horses coming into a huge race with only three lifetime starts are created equal, sir. Early voting had uh, debuted in December. He had two nine furlong graded stakes races before the Preakness. Creative Minister, he did not debut until March. He had never been in a stakes race. He had never been farther than a mile and a 16th. Uh, certainly he was third best at the best here, but it was a good performance for a horse who's extremely lightly raced. He's the horse coming out of this Preakness that will be in the Belmont Stakes. Yeah, and he certainly has every right to improve for all of those reasons that you mentioned, Brian. He's got stakes experience. He ran against some really good horses. He held his own and a good performance. Um, the the gamble that uh, Kenny McPeak and the other owners of uh, Creative Minister took in, in supplementing uh, the horse for $150,000 uh, into the Preakness turned into a little bit of a profit. They, they brought home about $181,000 in purse money. So I guess it was a good gamble. Hopefully he'll move ahead and, and be an interesting part of the Belmont Stakes. Yeah, on, on paper, he is an interesting part of the Belmont Stakes. I, I worry about horses so lightly raced, uh, running pretty darn well in a race like the Preakness, coming back quickly for a mile and a half, three weeks. See, even I'm doing it now. Coming back quickly for the Belmont Stakes at a mile and a half. It, it, it is another tough spot for a creative minister, but if he somehow can move a little bit forward again, maybe he's, uh, he, maybe he's a real horse to watch and maybe a horse to beat in the Belmont Stakes map. Let's talk about that. No, you know what? First, I want to get your impression on Happy Jack. I already mentioned it. Happy Jack, 11 to 1. Fenwick, 13 to 1. What the heck is going on with these horses being bet like that in a race that they have no possible chance to win? Yeah, or, I don't know. I'm for saying that because Rich Strike won the Derby at 80 to 1. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't, didn't understand the petting. I didn't understand that the, those three horses uh, uh, all – went to the gate at less than 20 to one when some of them in my eyes should have been 50, 60 to one. Geez, Brian, I wish they had offered the, the trifecta bet for the last three horses to finish. I would have nailed that one. Me. Oh, me too. Those, those were the three that I completely threw <laughs> out and, and to see happy Jack at 11 to one and Fenwick at 13 to one is, is just baffling. Matt, let's jump to the Belmont. Uh, we talked about no Preakness winner, no epicenter in the Belmont, no uh, secret oath in the Belmont, but we do have a pretty interesting race here. It, of course, includes the Kentucky Derby winner, Rich Strike, uh, doing, pu pulling a Giacomo from 40 years earlier, waiting for a race that they think he's better suited for, a mile and a half. Uh, the good thing about Rich Strike, one of the reasons I bet Rich Strike in the Derby a little bit, Matt, was how he was working. And the good news is he seems like he's working really well 
since the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, and I think the that uh, trainer Eric Reed plans on sending uh, Rich Strike up to New York uh, uh, at maybe next week. I, I saw something like uh, uh, May 31st, so next week he'll be up in New York and and give him you know a, a week and a half or so to acclimate to new surroundings and a new surface, etc. Um, you know he. It's good to have the Derby winner in there, but we've also got coming back from the 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 Derby. We've got Mo Donegal coming back. Uh, you know, who has been New York based, ran well in in, uh, in New York, won that Wood Memorial, um, doing the Todd Pletcher thing, running in the Derby, and he was fifth in the Derby. I thought, you know, pretty good effort uh, overall. I think some people were disappointed with that performance, but overall I thought it was pretty good. And, uh, you know, uh, Pletcher's got a great record in the Belmont, uh, and has used this strategy before to, uh, to run in the Derby, skip the Preakness and come back at home for the Belmont stakes. Yeah. Bringing up Mo Donegal at this point, Matt makes sense because I think Mo Donegal is the horse to beat in the Belmont stakes. I also think Mo Donegal will be the favorite in the Belmont stakes over over the Kentucky Derby winner, over We the People, an impressive winner of the uh, Peter Pan before the Preakness. So yeah, Mo Donegal, Rich Strike, they were possible um, horses who greatly benefited from a very fast pace in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, one of them certainly did. That's Rich Strike. He, a horse of very little early speed, was able to weave his way through, as we've seen so many times under Sonny Leon, and win that Kentucky Derby. Mo Donegal, on the other hand, he drew the rail. He dropped back inside. He was, uh, he was with other horses for much of the trip. He swung way wide. And he was beaten three or four lengths for all the money. Um, the one thing I would say between Mo Donegal and Rich Strike, uh, of course, before the Derby, Mo Donegal had the better form. But of the two, I would think Mo Donegal's the one that's able to handle a slower pace, uh, a little bit better than Rich Strike. That remains to be seen. But what, from what I've seen, Rich Strike really is a horse that wants to lay back and make one run. Mo Donegal's mostly like that, but I have seen him a little bit closer to some paces in his career. So I I feel like if this is a typical Belmont pace where they're running 113 early, Mo Donegal of the two, and maybe the two name horses in this race, he has more ability to at least stay in touch early and kind of grind it out in the stretch and still run a big race. Yeah, I agree, Brian. You know, and a lot of people will, look, you know, look at the kind of performance that Rich Strike had to uh, win the uh, Kentucky Derby, that that late move and, and the appearance that he was moving so fast at the end of the race. They take that as like, oh, this is this is the perfect horse for the Belmont Stakes. They're going to be able to handle the mile and a half. And, and that isn't necessarily the case, always these deep, deep closers uh, uh, succeeding in the mile and a half Belmont stakes. Oh, absolutely. That's that's 100% true. Horse racing does not work like that, folks. Uh, sometimes it works out. And, and you do have a horse coming from well back, a creator type to win the Belmont. But generally speaking, that's not the case because we're going to get a slower pace. And, and then the horses are, at, to some extent, for whatever uh, energy they have left, they're kind of sprinting from the uh, the, the turn home to the wire, and it, it becomes tougher to rally from well back after you've already run nine or ten furlongs. Uh, I, often, I, I like horses that have no speed who come from way back in a six furlong sprint if the race is set up well. And uh, conversely, I like horses that can be on the lead in a twelve furlong race if the race sets up well, well for them. Speaking of speed, I think we do have to mention We the People because I think he's the other real horse to bet in here. Uh, maybe Creative Minister is, is is another one to bet a little bit in the Belmont. But We the People, we've seen this Peter Pan as a, as a pretty key prep for the Belmont Stakes over the years. It, it doesn't happen every year because the Peter Pan doesn't get the Kentucky Derby horses off, obviously. But often horses who run well over the track at Belmont Park in the Peter Pan, come back and do well in the Belmont. I've seen people poo-pooing We the People a little bit, Matt, 
because we the people, uh, maybe he didn't beat a great field in the Peter Pan, maybe uh, the, the, the sloppy or the, or the wet sealed truck on Peter Pan Day uh, made things look bigger than they actually were when he won by an absolute pole in the Peter Pan. But in my eyes, that was a big performance by a lightly raced, improving horse, well-bred, uh, out of a big, big time stable and a big performance over the track in a field here as we look at the Belmont that really doesn't have this, another speed horse. Yeah, that's for sure. And, and I, you know, there are valid questions to be asked about We the People. And, and you mentioned some of them, Brian, that uh, that performance was, you know, uh, uh, on a wet track. And maybe it was the wet track that helped him rebound from a seventh place finish in the Arkansas Derby. And we talked earlier in the show about the the Arkansas Derby um, and, and horses moving on from there. Um, but we, we shall see. And, and Rudolph Brissett is the trainer, a former assistant for Bill Mott, spent an enormous amount of time in, in the formative years in his career at Belmont Park. So he's familiar with getting uh, horses ready for the test of the champion and knows the kind of horse that is suited to success in there. So uh, those are positives for we, the people, but yeah, I think the most positive thing is that uh, it's got a little bit of speed and, and that will certainly be a very helpful factor for we, the people. Yeah. Got a little speed, but also don't, don't uh, discount the win over the track or the very nice race over the track as well. I think that's an important factor here as we handicap this Belmont Stakes. As we look at the rest of the field, Matt, yeah, Creative Minister, we've already talked about him a little bit. Uh, he's got uh, long-winded pedigree on both sides of his, uh, of his uh, breeding. So I think Creative Minister could be a horse who can handle 12 furlongs. We, we said he's coming out of a tough race for the Preakness and he ran on Derby Day. So he's kind of running his own version of the Triple Crown with uh, five weeks separating these three races. So it could be tough for a lightly raced son of creative cause, but really good allowance win at Churchill Downs on Derby Day and a very good performance in the Preakness coming off the rail. And uh, uh, in fact, if he had waited a little bit more, BJ Hernandez Jr., a, a wonderful jockey and a, and a good guy, uh, if he had waited on the rail a little bit more for Armagnac to uh, to uh, start stopping and coming off the rail, it would have opened up for him uh, as it later opened up for Epicenter. And that could have been a difference in him uh, really threatening, uh, at least for second place. But Creative Minister, an in interesting horse. We will, looks like we will get another filly here, Matt. Uh, the second filly in the second Triple Crown race will be Nest, who is second behind uh, Secret Oath, of course, in the Kentucky Oaks. She's got the breeding to go 12 furlongs as well. And she's also trained, of course, by Todd Pletcher. Right. And there we go. Todd Pletcher again doing the, you know, it's not the Kentucky Derby and then skipping the Preakness, but it's going from the Kentucky Oaks, you know, the, the same weekend to the Belmont. But we all know historically that Todd Pletcher has won the Belmont Stakes with a filly before with rags to riches. Um, Pletcher is very good at identifying horses that can get the 12 furlongs. Uh, that second place finish in the Oaks was was notable. We talked about the big four fillies in there and and Nest handled uh, uh, two of them, but but could not handle secret oath so it'll be interesting having uh, uh the filly in there uh especially because it's from pletcher yeah i, I mentioned nest early on as a, as a potential belmont filly you know todd pletcher won it with racks to riches as you say coincidentally nest is sired by curlin who was the horse that rich uh racks to riches upset in that belmont stakes but anyway nest is a a, a filly with that kind of pedigree and and she looks like she would love a distance looking at every single one of her races she's also become a filly who can lay uh, reasonably close to the pace and pounce and uh, that could be a good thing in the Belmont Stakes so I would not discount the filly we said that creative minister was the big horse coming out of the Preakness was showing no respect at all to Skippy Longstocking match should we be respecting Skippy Longstocking off his third place Wood Memorial and his fifth place Preakness finish. Um, 
I'm not going to, Brian. I wasn't very excited about Skippy Longstocking going into uh, the Preakness, and and I thought his the race that he ran in the Preakness was kind of similar, you know, to the result in the Wood Memorial. Um, so I'll be surprised if he uh, uh, steps forward from from that those two kind of similar performances. Yeah, Ethereal Road was a big winner. Uh, on Preakness Day in the Sir Barton, uh, overcoming a uh, track that looked like it was favoring speed. He rallied nicely on the outside to mow down the field that day. Ethereal Road will, of course, be going from uh, AA competition in the Sir Barton up to, uh, to Grade 1 Belmont Stakes competition. D. Wayne Lucas, uh, again, is making himself known in the third leg of the Triple Crown. Yeah, and Ethereal Road looked very good uh, winning the Sir Barton. And as you mentioned, a lot of people had started up that the there was a bias, and and you know, you know, I'm not sure how much of it there was. Uh, uh, different kinds of races, lower uh, quality races earlier on in the card, but anyway, uh, Ethereal Road turned around his form after three or four kind of lackluster performances. Uh, on the Kentucky Derby Trail, um, he looked good winning the Sir Barton. But again, uh, now he's got to step back up uh, in company to grade ones and seem to struggle against better competition earlier on. Is he getting better again? Is he in his best form? Or is it the level of competition? Right, and I would uh, I would warn people that are jumping on Ethereal Road after the Sir Barton that that was a pretty weak field that he was beating the Sir Barton. But yeah, he's shown flashes where perhaps you think if things go right, a la uh, uh, Sarava uh, several years ago that won out of the Sir Barton. Maybe Ethereal Road can have his day in the Belmont. I, I we know D Wayne Lucas can get a horse ready for the Belmont Stakes. Uh, Kucher, Golden Glider, coming off of uh, Kucher, won an allowance race recently at Churchill Downs. Golden Glider was uh, second, I guess, a long way second behind We the People and the Peter Pan. Those horses would be pretty big surprises for me. But we still haven't mentioned Barber Road, who was pretty much glued to Mo Donegal for much of that Kentucky Derby when he finished sixth, one place behind, less than a length behind Mo Donegal in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, hey, once again, uh, Barbara Road with a, a really good performance in the Kentucky Derby, finishing sixth, as you mentioned, just behind uh, Mo Donegal, adding to, you know, the the performances on the Kentucky Derby Trail at Oakland Park, where he was second and third and second and second, always seeming to come up with a run at the end. He did it again in the Kentucky Derby. So for me... Uh, it, it's going to be pretty hard to say uh, to, that Barbara Road once again isn't going to be a factor in the Super Factor or the Trifecta at the end of the Belmont Stakes. Why not? He's 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 always trying. He's always rallying every race. We saw it again in the Kentucky Derby, folks. That's the field of ten as we know it now. Uh, we wouldn't expect another really big name to join this Belmont Stakes list, but you never know. We're still two weeks out, of course, from the Belmont, the final leg of the Triple Crown, a mile and a half on June 11 at Belmont. But uh, these are the 10 we're looking at right now. And certainly we would say Mo Donegal looks like the most likely favorite with Rich Strike and We the People and Creative Minister uh, not too far behind. Pretty interesting field for the Belmont Stakes, Matt. I also want to remind you folks, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel here on Horse Racing Nation, you could go ahead and do that now. We sure do appreciate it. Turn on those notifications for us, Matt. We also want to talk about some of the other stakes real quick on Belmont Stakes Day. It's one of the best days of racing of the year. Uh, we are definitely looking forward to a Latruska and a Malathot showdown because last year's Breeders' Cup distaff was a little bit nutty out at Del Mar with that crazy fast pace. So hopefully we'll get a real true showdown in the Ogden Phipps grade one probably the two best older females in the country, Latruska and Malathot Matt. But the Met Mile is one of our favorite races of the year. And uh, we thought we might see life is good, but uh, we've been waiting for the comeback, of course, of Flightline. And uh, folks, if you don't know who Flightline is, I don't know where you've been uh, the last year or so, because Flightline, Matt, his first three races are just, are just nuts how impressive they were. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely, Brian. If you take a look at the past performances of uh, Flightline, you'll notice those three wins all. Look at it. We've got it on the screen there by double-digit margins uh, for those three races. Um, and if you add them up, it, I think it's like a combined 37 lengths or something. Uh, this horse is fast. This horse goes to the lead. And this horse runs, but you can see on there uh, three races with a lot of time in between them, six furlongs, six furlongs, and most recently, seven furlongs in the Malibu. I say most recently, but that Malibu, Brian, was back on the day after Christmas. Yeah, we're talking uh, We're talking nearly six months between his last race and the Met Mile. We sure hope to see Flightline because he's obviously – a unique and rare talent, Matt. You see 108s for his first two races. Uh, horses don't do that uh, twice in a row, especially as he's winning those first two races by a combined 26 lengths. You see the crazy buyer speed figures by his name. And then the Malibu, perhaps his toughest competition in the Malibu did not, Dr. Scheibel didn't, didn't uh, wasn't healthy, came back sick uh, right after the race. So maybe that, uh, uh, added to the final margin there, but Flightline could not have been more impressive, Matt. Uh, it's hard for me to remember a horse who's been more impressive in three races. The time between all of his races and the fact that he's only run three times now, uh, almost halfway through his four-year-old year, is a concern. Working well, uh, Flightline looks like a horse that we should be very interested to see in the Met Mile. Oh, yeah, for sure, Brian. I'm, I'm very interested to have the opportunity to see this horse uh, run at Belmont Park. But quite frankly, I'm going to restrain my enthusiasm until I know that he is shipped to Belmont and that we're close to the race and he's going to get in the gate because obviously he's a delicately put together horse. But, uh, you know, it's it's going to be pretty cool if he runs in the race. It, and you had mentioned earlier in the show, Brian, you know, uh, 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 races where uh, uh, shorter races, sprint races, the mile one turn race, anything can happen in these in the Met Mile. We've seen front runners, but plenty of times we've seen off the pace runners win the Met Mile. Yeah, and, and, you know, Jackie's Warrior is listed as a possible right now for the Met Mile. If Jackie's Warrior is, in fact, in the Met Mile, they're talking about the True North, and maybe the True North is more of a likely option for the sprint champion of last year. But if Jackie's Warrior is in the Met Mile, that instantly creates a strong early pace that Flightline will have to either show a new dimension by coming from just off the pace, or they're going to run super fast. And let's not forget it's about Speaker's Corner. Speaker's Corner has been pointing for this Met Mile all year. And he's another four-year-old who's, who's taking a more uh, 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 traditional approach to uh, becoming a very good older horse than Flightline. Speaker's Corner showed some real talent at two. Uh, he missed some time, but he came back and he was getting good as a three-year-old. And now as a four-year-old, he's looked absolutely terrific. Maybe if we're comparing to the past performances we had up there on Flightline, Speaker's Corner is going to uh, fall a little bit short in comparison, but what Speaker's Corner has done consistently this year has been ultra impressive. Yeah, getting good, Brian. He is good right now. Bill Mott's figured him out uh, for sure. Two nice wins uh, at uh, Gulfstream Park in the Hooper grade three, then stretching out to a mile, the one turn mile. Uh, uh, at Gulfstream Park in the Gulfstream Park Mile Grade 2, and then back to New York for the Carter, a, tr a traditional prep race for the Met Mile at Aqueduct, the Grade 1 Carter. He's, he's really, really become a strong four-year-old. Right. So a flight line is not, for whatever reason, uh, if he's in the race and he's not 100%, after the six months or so off, uh, Speaker's Corner could certainly upset Flightline. I, I have a feeling Flightline's going to be a huge favorite once again off those those three monster wins to begin his career. And if, in fact, it is, a, uh, Speaker's Corner has speed, maybe not Flightline speed, but Speaker's Corner also has plenty of speed. If there is a really fast pace in this one-turn mile, don't forget about Aloha West, who won the Breeders' Cup sprint last year, likes to come from off the pace. He's had a prep and Aloha West could be an interesting horse if you're looking for someone to come from off the pace in this 
interesting that mile. Oh yeah, well he did it in the Breeders' Cup uh, sprint, and and uh, veteran trainer uh, Wayne Catalano, you know, certainly uh, didn't have him fully cranked for his return in the Churchill Downs, a Grade One, and and he finished third and 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 ran a good race, but you know, Catalano is an old fashioned old time kind of trainer, and and was probably not looking for a win in that, looking ahead to the campaign uh, campaign that was coming for Aloha West. Hey, I'd love to see him and love to see Catalano uh, as part of that Met Mile field. Yeah, yeah, we expect Aloha West, and Aloha West is a very good horse. Don't sleep on him just because he ran third. In his uh, debut this year, he was certainly getting better and better as the year went on last year. The Breeders' Cup Sprint was not his only really strong race, and like we said, he likes to come from behind. All right, Matt, that's our show, our early look at the Belmont Stakes and Belmont Day with uh, featured with the Met Mile, Lone Star Park, Big Day, Hollywood Gold Cup on Monday. Let me get a parting shot from you before we say goodbye. Absolutely. As I mentioned, it's Memorial Day weekend. And hey, not too many years ago, the Met Mile was run on Memorial Day weekend, but now in the the, uh, the big uh, super card on Belmont Stakes Day, um, that's okay. Uh, but enjoy, my point was enjoy the good racing around the country in uh, on Memorial Day weekend and on Memorial Day, including that big card at Lone Star Park. There you go, Matt Schiffman. Always my pleasure to uh, be here with you, my friend. Thanks to our sponsor, the best contest site out there. That's Derby Wars. Thanks to Candace Curtis for the race graphic for that early look at the Belmont Stakes. And most of all, thanks to all you for watching, tuning in every week to watch Horse Center. We sure do appreciate you. Good luck at the races this holiday weekend. Have a good holiday. We'll be back with much, much more talk about Belmont Stakes and Belmont Stakes Day here next week on Horse Center.